My name is Jonathan Goforth with Keller Williams Platinum Partners. I say that because it could be a test question, but on this video, we're gonna do a shorter video. I'm gonna do five questions. These questions are good in all 50 states. Uh, this is a good um, practice video to help uh, see how you're doing on the retaining information. So let's jump right in, number 26. Uh, by the way, this is part two. At the very end of this, I'm going to put a link to uh, questions 1 through 25. That's a longer video and another video. I'll put two different links at the end of this to give you some more practice questions. But this one, we're going to do five questions. Let's start with number 26. State laws operate differently as to when a buyer is entitled to know about A, the basement flooding when it rains hard, B, a suicide that occurred in the house, C, lead paint reports on a home built before 1978. D, the reason the sellers are moving is that they're getting a divorce. So now I'd like to read the question again. State laws operate differently as to when a buyer is entitled to know about. Now your, your answer on this is B. B is the answer to this question. We're going to cover these answers so that you understand why. Because in practicing for this, these questions can be thrown at you in a lot of different formats. And so if you know why the other three are wrong on this, you're gonna get many different questions correct going into an exam like this. You know, I've heard, I've been doing this 26 years, and um, a few years ago I went back and took my broker's test. I'm licensed in two states, by the way, Kansas and Missouri. And uh, I, I say that on this question because for B, states operate differently when it comes to suicides. What needs to be disclosed? What is the buyer entitled to know about? And here in the Midwest, Kansas uh, operates differently than Missouri does. And throughout the nation, states have different opinions in what they expect a buyer to be entitled to know about. So, C, lead paint reports on a home built before 1978. That's national. Every single home built before 1978, it's required that there is a lead paint addendum that you're going to be using on every listing. You're going to see this form. And that's why it says 1978. That's a key year. I want you to know that. Uh, lead paint reports are required on properties built before 1978. D, the reason the sellers are moving is that they are getting a divorce. The buyer is not entitled to know about that. It's, it's not the buyer's, it's not the seller to uh, have to disclose that. They don't have to let any buyers know they're getting a divorce. That's private. And that does not vary differently between states. That's true for all 50 states. Um, and that's why the answer is not D. No buyer is entitled to know that the sellers are getting a divorce in any state in the country. And so that's why your answer is B. Now, if this happens and over time with you selling a, enough property, this is going to pop up. So that's why I'm using this question to help you practice with. You could see this on a state exam because states uh, vary. They operate differently. If you go on a listing appointment and you find out there has been a suicide that occurred in that house, you need to call your broker. Call your broker. That could be an answer to a test question if it's formatted differently on a state exam. You call your broker. And why do you call your broker? Because the state laws operate differently when it comes to suicides that occurred in the house. Number 27. Regarding the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which of the following can a lender not do? A, verify a borrower's income sources. B, refuse a borrower who is receiving income from public assistance. C, tell the applicant within 30 days of denial or granting of credit. Or D, give specific reasons why the credit was denied. So the question again, regarding the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which of the following can a lender not do? Your answer is B. 
a lender cannot refuse a borrower who is receiving income from public assistance. You're just going to have to learn that one. You just memorize that. A lender cannot do that because income from public assistance counts. They can use that to qualify for a loan. And then a lender can do the other three options on there. So your answer on that was B. Number 28. The amount borrowed is called the A, loan amortization or loan origination fee or the loan principal amount or the escrow portion of the loan. Well, let's talk about this a little bit. We've got some big vocabulary words in here you really need to know. The amount borrowed is called the, and your answer is C. The amount borrowed is called the loan principal amount. That's the principal. That's what it is. The principal amount is the amount that's been borrowed for the loan. So let's talk about what these others are, because these are terms you actually will see throughout your career. The loan amortization, that's a schedule. So let's say it's a 30-year loan. At uh, closing, the buyer is going to be given an amortization schedule, and it's 360 line items, and it's going through the amortization of the loan from month one all the way through the end of the 30 years in month number 360, showing the difference of uh, breakdown between principal and interest as that loan slowly gets paid off. That's the loan amortization. Uh, B, and it's, it's a schedule. That's what the loan amortization is. It's a, it's a huge, like a spreadsheet looking thing. B is the loan origination fee. That's a fee charged by the lender. That's just a fee that the lender charges for uh, taking out the loan. It's charged on the buyer. You will see the loan origination fee on a good faith estimate on your buyers. And you'll definitely see it at the end, at the uh, final closing statement, when uh, the buyer is there with you at the closing, you'll see a loan origination fee. We talked about C, the loan principal amount. That's the amount borrowed. And then D is the escrow portion of the loan. What is the escrow portion of the loan? Well, escrow, let's talk about what escrow is. Chances are the lender is going to have the buyer escrow for taxes and insurance. So part of their monthly payment, in addition to the principal and interest, the buyer's going to pay a little extra, the amount of taxes for that year and the amount of insurance for the year divided by 12 months, and they pay that each month. So it's building up, building up until it comes time to pay it again. Then the lender pays it for them. The lender does this to make sure taxes and insurance get paid. And that's the purpose of the escrow account. And so that's what escrowing is. It's uh, You'll see this at... Uh, Closing, also, when they do the final mortgage payments, it'll be principal and interest plus taxes and insurance. And that's what the escrow portion is. Number 29, which of the following would be classified as a general lien? Judgment lien, property tax lien, real estate property tax lien, or a mechanics lien? I like this question because this is one a lot of people have missed. This is why it's on here for you to practice with. Now, you might think you already know. You've done a great job studying your material, and that's awesome. You need to keep studying. I'm going to give you uh, some suggestions right now. You need to study and cram everything into your head. Practice all the material that you're reading, and then what you're doing now, practicing test questions, is perfect because you might think you know all of it, and you probably do. But when you see it in the form of a test question, and now you're comparing four different options, three of them are wrong, you've got to figure out the right one and you've got to do it quickly. So let's talk about these because this test question is a little bit confusing. It's designed to trick you up a little bit. Again, which of the following would be classified as a general lien? A judgment lien, property tax lien, a real estate property tax lien, or a mechanics lien? Well, we got two of them on there that are kind of similar. 
So it kind of looks like uh, a general lien would probably maybe be uh, B because C looks specific. A real estate property tax lien. That seems a lot more specific than just B, just a property tax lien. That's where people get stumped on this one and they'll pick the wrong answer. Your answer is A, a judgment lien. That is a general lien. A judgment lien is something that can be placed broadly across multiple different things. Um, it's a judgment lien over different assets uh, a person can own. But B is a property tax lien. C is a real estate property tax lien. Those are the same thing. <laughs> Those are the same thing. They are specific liens. They are only placed on the property. So those are specific liens because a property has gone uh, delinquent on paying its taxes. And so now there's a property tax lien, which is the same as a real estate property tax lien. They're placed against a, a specific property. Those are specific liens. D is a mechanics lien. That's also a specific lien. A mechanics lien is placed on a specific property where somebody has gone to do work on that specific home. They have not been paid. And so they are going to place a lien a, uh, to get paid against the specific property where they did the work. So the bottom three choices, B, C, and D, those are specific liens. Your only option is a, a general lien would be a, a judgment lien is more broad. It can be placed on multiple things at the same time. So before we get ready to wrap this up, make sure you subscribe because I want you to come back, check out all my other videos on how to make a lot of money in real estate. You know, I will just share with you personally, I've been doing this a long time. I've been, I was listening to Forbes magazine in 2019, 2020, and 21 as one of the top market leaders in the country. Uh, my team, I have a team of, re of realtors on my team. I have the goforthteam.com if you ever want to pull me up. Um, we were paid commission over a million dollars last year and the year before. We've been doing that for a while. I love real estate. It is the best career ever. It is my dream job. So please subscribe. That's for you. So you get notified of future videos. And then if you like my video, that is for me. <laughs> It just makes me feel good. So let's do number 30. The best information source a broker can use in determining a list price for a home is A, what the uh, owner originally paid for it, B, the list prices of other homes not in the same area, C, the appraised value of a comparable property, D, the assessed value of a comparable property, or E, Zillow. <laughs> now, it's kind of funny I put Zillow on there. Uh, your real answer choices are really A through D, but it's funny, I just added Zillow on this because when you go on a listing appointment, your seller, your potential seller, has already priced their property using Zillow. <laughs> and I'll tell you, Zillow is not very accurate, um, but that's what your client is using. And so you will not be pricing their house using Zillow, but I do like to look at Zillow um, and every other source I can find because I want to know what my client's about to tell me. If I think their house is worth 400000 and Zillow is saying 625000 I don't want to be caught off guard when I know they're about to tell me, well, you know, Zillow says it's worth six and a quarter and that's what I think we should price it at. Uh-huh. So... Again, the question says the best information source a broker can use in determining a list price for a home is A, what the owner originally paid for it, B, the list prices of other homes not in the same area, C, the appraised value of a comparable property, or D, the assessed value. Your answer is C. C is the best information source that you can use when you're determining a listing price. And this is, uh, that is exactly what you do before you go to every listing appointment. And I will just share with you, there's a lot of things in um, your material that you're studying. You're not going to use them in your real estate career. You're, if you're going to be a residential agent, you're going to be tested on commercial real estate also. You have to know that. 
uh, you're going to be tested on lending type questions, which we just did one of. You know, number 27, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. You're not going to typically bump into that. You're not a lender. But this one, question 30, if you can get an appraised value of a comparable property, that is the best way to price a uh, home you're going to go hopefully get to list. Um, I do think it's interesting what an owner originally paid for it. I'm always curious, and I always look that up if, if I can find it in MLS. I want to see what they paid. There's other information on that listing sheet I need to see. Square feet, what year did they close on it? I want to see all that. Um, B, I want you to look at that. B, the list prices of other homes not in the same area. See that word not? They're not in the same area. They don't count. Those those list prices don't count. They would not be used by you. They would not be used by an appraiser. They're not even in the same area. You need, uh, you need sale prices is what you need when you go price a home. But if you can ever get an appraised value of a comparable property, that is your best uh, information source. So thanks for watching. Um, Check out the other video links that have already popped up on your screen. Keep studying. Go take the exam as fast as you can. Cram all of this in your head. Do not delay on taking the exam. Go get it done. If you don't pass the first time, then you study again like crazy and you take it again as fast as you can. Get through this short chapter in your life as fast as you can and then begin the most awesome career ever known to man. <laughs> I love real estate. I hope you can tell that. Again, thanks for watching.